we need to talk about Kurdistan. But first, the obligatory video introduction. I am Kevin Tracy, and you, you incredible, beautiful, amazing person, you have found one of my weekly art videos. In these videos, I don't offer a tutorial, but thoughtful commentary to provide you with insight about the inspirations and motivations behind the creative choices an artist makes. My goal is to inspire you by helping you find new creative ways to look at your own art and maybe even some unique problems you're facing. If you like the art I create or what I have to say, then let me know that by hitting the like button. And if you find yourself really enjoying this type of video, then I really hope you'll consider subscribing and joining our growing community. Now, some of you may already know this, but I'm not a classically trained artist. I didn't go to art school, which is part of the reason why I don't do tutorial videos. After years in the military and the counterterrorism field, I decided to use the GI Bill to attend Purdue University and study foreign affairs. So although I don't follow politics as closely as I did a few years ago, I still instinctively tune in and listen to any international headlines that may pass my way. Anyway, my dog and I were coming back from our frolicking at the dog park and I happened to have relevant radio on in my truck. And every hour or so, they have someone from EWTN read the global news. And among them was a very simple statement. President Trump has announced the withdrawal of all the US troops from Syria. That's all they said, no other details. And thankfully, I was at a red light because I probably would have wrecked my truck. And I yelled out, what about the Kurds? It wasn't until the next day that the news outlets, politicians, soldiers, Marines, airmen, veterans, and the Kurds themselves were screaming bloody murder when we realized that we were sending our longtime allies down Shit's Creek without a paddle. I said before that I don't get angry anymore, but my heart was breaking at this news more so than at any other news that I've heard since the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Whereas th that was a mixture of heartbreak and anger back then, this was heartbreak and complete disbelief. And that's just what I'm feeling. I can't, I don't even think there are words that can describe the emotions of the Kurdish people when that news hit them. But where words fail us, that's an opportunity for us to powerfully convey true meaning through visual art. Now, I'm guessing most of you here watching this video probably don't care about this issue like I do. Yeah, you probably heard the headlines and thought it was kind of crappy that we were abandoning an ally, but then again, America does a lot of crappy things, let's face it. Give me a minute to try to convince you why this isn't just some other crappy thing that America does and explain why so many of us, especially veterans, are so upset about this. I don't think I'm shocking anybody here when I say that the Middle East is a volatile, unstable, and oftentimes just batshit crazy place. Brutal military dictatorships, Sunni and Shia religious extremists, racial extremist monarchies, war, terrorism, that one Jewish country that everyone has threatened to wipe off the face of the map at some point, popular uprisings, sex slavery, mutilation, tribal politics, stonings, hangings, and what little stability exists only exists because the United States and Russia funnel a tremendous amount of military and financial aid to these countries because this entire region sits above enormous natural reserves of oil. Yet, in all of this chaos, there is one group of people who shockingly, relative to everyone else in the region, has their shit together. This would be the Kurds. The Kurdish ethnic group is culturally rich and diverse, yet distinctive and undeniably beautiful. Although they're surrounded by extremists who oppress women and treat them like property, Kurdish women are recognized for the incredible gifts and talents that they offer. They fight alongside their men and their militias. And although they're overwhelmingly Muslim, they are remarkably tolerant of other people and other faiths and cultures. And although their very existence is often defined by the political instability of the region, their autonomous and sometimes de facto governing bodies are probably more stable than any Middle East country, including Israel. After 9-11, the United States sought to reform the Middle East. The vision we had, but have since lost sight of and many of us have since forgotten, was a Middle East that looked remarkably like Kurdistan. 
Besides maybe a handful of low-ranking people at the CIA and DIA assigned to the Iraq group, I don't think anybody really realized that Kurdistan should have been our model for reform at the time. However, after witnessing the professionalism, bravery, and conviction of the Kurds during the Iraq War and more recently in our war against ISIS, this was slowly realized by a great many U.S. servicemen in all ranks of the military and a relatively small group of mostly but not entirely Republican congressmen who actually listened to them. If there was ever a group of people who deserved their own country, it would be the Kurds. Now, you might be wondering, why don't the Kurds already have their own country? And I don't switch off, I promise, I'm not going to make this boring. During World War I, the Ottoman Empire, modern-day Turkey, sided with Germany and Austria against Britain, France, and Russia. And after the war, the Ottoman Empire was split between Britain and France. As the European empires had traditionally done, they then split this new territory into more manageable, smaller pieces. And just like they did in Africa, the lines they drew were drawn with a straight edge on a map with absolutely zero regard for the ethnic, tribal, and religious differences among the people living there. Forgive me for using this term, but the, from the perspective of the British and French, these were all just a bunch of nomadic Mohammed men, which was an antiquated and wildly inaccurate way of identifying Muslims. Anyway, by the end of World War II, both Britain and France realized that they were making a hot mess in the Middle East, and since colonialism was on its way out and globalism was on its way in, they said screw it and gave independence to these territories, assigned their best friends as monarchs, and left. Then the Cold War happened, and oil became immensely important. Before the region could completely devolve and reform itself naturally along true ethnic and cultural lines, Tremendous amounts of money and advanced military arms were being funneled into the region by both the United States and the Soviet Union. If we were worried a monarch would be even remotely tolerant of the Soviets, we'd replace him with a military dictatorship, which is a simplified explanation of where Saddam Hussein came from. In the process, the governments of these arbitrarily carved out countries became unnaturally powerful and their borders unnaturally stable. The area that should be Kurdistan is split pretty evenly between Iraq, Turkey, Syria, and Iran, and it just so happens that there's a lot of oil there, and so none of these countries want to give up that space. Now, during the good times, the Kurds in each of these countries have general autonomy. As long as they pay their taxes, they can do pretty much whatever they want. But during the bad times, the Kurds are used as the scapegoat for all the country's problems, just like the Nazis used the Jews in the 1930s and 40s in Germany. And just like this subjected European Jews to the Holocaust, this has led to several attempts of genocide against the Kurds. Eventually, the Kurds learned that they had to fight back to provide a deterrent. In the 1990s, it was mostly Iraq that we heard about, and if you're old enough to remember this, in a time before the Iraq War, you may remember talk of the northern no-fly zone and Saddam Hussein taking shots at US and British planes patrolling the no-fly zones. Well, that northern no-fly zone existed largely to protect the Kurds from the chemical weapons of Saddam Hussein's regime that they had previously used on them. However, while Iraq got more attention, realistically, Turkey was almost equally as brutal. However, Turkey was a strategic ally against the Soviet Union in the Cold War and remained a country we propped up after the fall of the Soviet Union, so it wasn't really talked about in the halls of government, if you know what I mean. Having learned of the Holocaust and fully aware of the Armenian genocide by the Ottoman Empire, and yes, we need to be courageous and call that a genocide, the Kurds took their defense into their own hands. They formed their own governments and they formed their own militias. They sought training from Soviet special forces and they made themselves into a force to be reckoned with. That's not to say that they're always in agreement with each other, but they work through their differences peacefully because they know they're in this together. And what's at stake isn't the outcome of some vote, but their very existence. In a lot of ways, the movement for Kurdish independence mimics the movement for American independence. Our founding fathers didn't all get along. They fought bitterly before, during, and after the Revolutionary War, but they stayed together and mutually pledged to each other their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. But whereas we only sought representation and just courts, they're literally fighting for their very survival from genocide. Whereas the American colonists, if they failed, would have remained British subjects for another 100 years or so, the Kurds would be scattered and dead if they failed. 
While U.S. forces were embedded with the Kurdish militia in Syria, no military in the world would dare bring harm to the Kurds for risk of killing an American soldier and finding themselves at war with the United States. But the exact moment that President Trump announced that he was pulling U.S. troops out, Turkey announced a military operation against the same Kurds we've been fighting alongside for years. And as soon as our troops were pulled out, bombs and artillery shells started falling on Kurdish territory, killing Kurdish civilians and the very men and women who stood shoulder to shoulder with us just days earlier. And look, I get where President Trump is coming from. Before 9-11, it was the Republican Party's platform to no longer be the policemen of the world. Then Governor Bush made that clear when he was running for president in 2000. I think what we need to do is convince people who live in the lands they live in to build the nations. Maybe I'm missing something here. I mean, we're gonna have kind of a nation building core from America? Absolutely not. Our military is meant to fight and win war. That's what it's meant to do. And when it gets overextended, morale drops. But I'm going to be judicious as to how to use the military. It needs to be in our vital interest, the mission needs to be clear, and the exit strategy obvious. But in the face of genocide, I'm reminded of the words of President Clinton during his first radio address after announcing we were going to war against Serbia and Slobodan Milosevic to protect the people of Kosovo. We asked these people of Kosovo to accept peace, and they did. We promised them we would stick by them if they did the right thing, and they did. We cannot let them down now. Americans have learned the hard way that our home is not that far from Europe. Through two world wars and a long Cold War, we saw that it was a short step from a small brush fire to an inferno, especially in the tinderbox of the Balkans. The time to put out a fire is before it spreads and burns down the neighborhood. By acting now, we're taking a strong step toward a goal that has always been in our national interest a peaceful, united, democratic Europe. For America, there is no greater calling than being a peacemaker. But sometimes, you have to fight in order to end the fighting. And yeah, I do doubt the sincerity of Clinton's words here, given that he likely only cared because he was caught with his pants down and needed a distraction. But somewhere in the West Wing, I do believe there was a speechwriter who penned this statement who sincerely believed it. And I think Every true American patriot deep down believes that. Our Declaration of Independence doesn't say that we hold any given truths inalienable in only certain geographic regions such as North America and Europe. We believe all men are endowed by their creator with inalienable rights, and the first among these is life. There's a case to be made that Britain and France are responsible for this, because they're the ones who drew up these stupid borders. So they should be the ones to have to figure it out. There's a case to be made that the Kurds should have to fight for their own independence. But Britain and France don't have the same international clout that they used to, and they can't stop Turkey or protect the Kurds. We can. And how can we forget that during our Revolutionary War, we didn't fight Britain alone. We had the military support of the French Empire. My favorite verse in scripture is from the book of Genesis, chapter four, verse nine. After killing Abel, then the Lord asks Cain, where is your brother Abel? He answered, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Now imagine, imagine how flippant Cain must have been there. The very reason I like this so much is because God doesn't answer Cain's question right away. Instead, everything that follows is a slow evolving story told through millennia and the entire point of it all is to answer Kane's flippant question. Yes, you are absolutely your brother's keeper in more ways than Kane could have ever imagined. America has failed the Kurds. We failed our brother. <sighs> well, that's the motivation. Let's talk about the art. In this piece, four young Kurdish soldiers are retreating from a still smoking city behind the distant mountains, evacuating with them an elderly woman, an infant child, and a man wounded with a serious abdominal wound. The elderly woman represents the history and the culture of the Kurdish people. She sits in a wheelchair, her head down, mourning the loss of so much life in her history and the history of the oppressed Kurdish people. She's pushed ahead, saved from death, and the culture from total destruction 
by a young female soldier, a woman who will undoubtedly carry the culture forward with militaristic conviction for as long as she may live, which may not be long. The look she's giving the viewer of the piece is intentionally painful, but difficult to interpret. It's confusion, it's betrayal, it's disappointment, it's anger, it's grief, it's fear, and it's resolve. Everything has changed, and yet nothing has changed. Behind her is another young soldier, this one carrying an infant child in one arm and a rifle in the other. His leg is obviously wounded, he's obviously in pain, but he's been entrusted with this child, representative of the future of the Kurdish people. So he'll endure the pain, he's ready to fight if he needs to in order to protect the future of his people. And behind them are two more soldiers, this time carrying a man on a stretcher. His abdomen is wrapped tight, applying pressure to his own wound, but still he's bleeding out. Still, despite being at death's door, he hangs on. This is meant to be representative again of the Kurdish people. As I was sketching this out, the thought crossed my mind to draw him laying face down on the stretcher with a knife in his back, as though to say he was stabbed in the back by the withdrawal of American forces. However, this would have been a little bit too garish and I was going for more subtlety in this piece. Besides that, I wanted to convey the pain of the Kurdish people in this piece, not just create a political cartoon. I thought about what it feels like to be betrayed, and it doesn't feel like you were stabbed in the back. It feels like you were punched in the gut. You feel sick to your stomach. The abdominal wound made so much more sense in this context, I thought. Of the soldiers carrying this wounded Kurd, the woman in front looks down as though in disappointment, but still she carries her burden with grace. In the back is a soldier without a face. Although the details would have been very few and very small had I drawn them in, I wanted him to represent the tens of millions of Kurds in Turkey and Syria and elsewhere who are ignored by the world but who still carry the burden of their Kurdish lineage. Anyway, this is probably going to be my lasting Tober video. I drew this on October 18th, and the prompt for the day was Misfit. And I don't think it's unfair to say that the Kurds in the Middle East are misfits in their chaotic political surroundings. We have this idea of the misfit being somehow dysfunctional, but I like how the Kurds illustrate for us that you can also be a misfit by being totally functional in a dysfunctional society. That's something I think everybody can learn from. Anyway, I hope you like this piece as much as I do. I've been using Inktober to play around with perspective and new art styles, and I'm planning on doing a couple anime shows in addition to the comic, fantasy, and pop culture shows that I've already been doing. I don't want to copy the anime style entirely, but I do want to try creating art that might be more appealing to those audiences as well, and Inktober has been a great playground for those kinds of experiments. Well, if you stuck around this long in the video, thank you for watching. I do hope you consider subscribing and sharing this video with your family and friends. I touched on a lot of history and sensitive topics in my very brief commentary for this video. My goal was to create a video providing some very brief context, but whenever you do that, you unavoidably oversimplify things. If there's anything you want to share or elaborate on, please feel free to leave a comment if you haven't already. Anyways, thanks for watching, but before you go, check out these other cool videos. On the left is a video where I draw some British propaganda art in MS Paint, and on the right is a video that YouTube thinks you'll like based on all their nerdy computer science stuff. Either way, I think you'll have fun. Thanks again for watching.